good old time Lobelia. Give me that good old time Lobelia. Give me that good old time Lobelia. You know it's good enough for me. It was good enough for our fathers. It was good enough for our mothers. It's good enough for our fathers. It's good enough for me. Give me that good old time Lobelia. Give me that good old time Lobelia. Give me that good old time Lobelia. from Herb TV. My name is Dave Lalazern. Several years ago, I became aware of a part of American herbal history represented by the eclectics. For about 100 years, eclectic physicians played an important role in the development of quality health care in, in the United States. From 1939, when the last eclectic medical school in Cincinnati closed its doors, until the 1970s, this tradition was largely forgotten. I became aware of the eclectics in an interview I did with David Winston. David is an herbalist and ethnobotanist who has been practicing Cherokee, Chinese, and Western herbal medicine since 1969. He told me about his personal rediscovery of the eclectics. Back in about 1972 or three, um, I was up visiting um, my girlfriend's brother up in Vermont. And we were, he was going to a school called Goddard, which is still there. And uh, we were at the local store, little store. And um, outside there's a big bulletin board. And on the bulletin board it said, book sale. And I said, oh, I want to go to the book sale. So we went over to the book sale. And there was this guy who actually, funny enough, I, I know today, and he's still in the book business. And he had his little bookstore in his basement. And this was in East Barry, Vermont. And I'm going in there, and I'm looking at the books, and there's this section of medical books, and there's these big, old books. And I open them up, and it's all herbs. It's all herbal. 90% of it was herbal, and I'd never heard or seen anything like this before. And what books am I looking at? I'm looking at King's American Dispensatory. I'm looking at all these really old, eclectic books. Now, at the time, they were priced, like some of the books were $50. And so the, everything was half price, so that meant it was 25 and some things were $75, that meant it was, I guess, $37.50. Now, though, that seems really cheap today, but in those days, this is 72 or 3, that was a lot of money. And I didn't have that much money, but these books were so fascinating that basically I, I got every penny I could get together and I bought all these books. And I remember coming back, I lived in New York at the time, coming back with two shopping bags full of books. And I think I had my train ticket, because I went, went on it by train, and 10 cents. That was all I had left. But I read these books, and I was fascinated, because here I, I come to discover that there were these medical doctors who were primarily using herbs in the 1800s, who called themselves eclectics. I had no idea till this time that they even existed. So basically, as I, I started to, to read this material, to find this material, to learn more and more about the eclectics, and as... American herbalists started to coalesce as a movement in the early 1980s, um, one of the things that came up is we started sharing between ourselves. So people who had training in Chinese medicine would talk to people who were trained in more of Western uh, uh, herbal medicine traditions and people like myself, and there weren't many at that time who had understanding of the eclectics, started talking about this. And it created this wonderful intellectual ferment. So from like 1981, when the first really sort of large-scale um, herbal symposium occurred, and that was at Brighton Bush in Oregon, um, through, for the next 10 or 15 years, there was this incredible growth in American herbalism. It went from a very simple Neo-Thompsonian slash Dr. Christopher, use cayenne pepper for almost everything, uh, and increase, you know, elimination, lots and lots of laxatives and things like that, to a much more sophisticated form of herbal medicine, incorporating aspects of eclectic medicine and what they call their black letter symptoms, aspects of Chinese medicine and the whole idea of energetics and differential diagnosis, to some degree Ayurveda, and this all came together. And so what we see as herbal medicine in the United States today is a very cosmopolitan a hybrid system in, for most people, many of the top herbalists, incorporating 
a range of traditions. And the eclectic is really the indigenous uh, sort of Western American tradition or um, American tradition in the sense of not Native American, but you know, once people actually settled here, the Europeans, and they created their own system of herbal medicine, eclectic medicine, and to a great degree, that system. John S. Howard, Jr. is a professor of history and medical humanities at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. He literally wrote the book about the eclectics. I'd like to read you the opening paragraph of the introduction to his book. In the freshness of its youth, the eclectic school of reform medicine stood as a symbol of America's optimism, imagination, enthusiasms, and eccentricities. Of solid Yankee inheritance, the school represented a powerful statement of the fraternity that its adherents felt with the great world movements of thought. In their writings, the eclectics portrayed themselves as authentic Protestants, saving therapeutics from the errors and extravagances of orthodox medicine. Along with homeopaths, they saw themselves as offering a viable alternative to those in the early decades of the 19th century who had wearied of allopathy's pretensions and failures. Having fostered a revolutionary challenge, they hoped to redress the shortcomings of orthodox practice with proof of their botanic successes, directing attention to a simpler and less drastic form of medicine. Although scornfully rejected by regulars, the eclectics imitated their magisterial air, as for a score of years and in two dozen colleges and more than 65 journals, they asserted the wisdom of their theory and the maxims of reform practice. North America was uh, essentially a Protestant uh, uh, nation, peoples, and um, uh, having come over through a variety, for a variety of reasons, uh, many of which were based on uh, religious uh, uh, reasons, and, um, and so you had a, a, um, a um, country that was filled with uh, any number of denominations, and uh, uh, you did not have a, um, a uh, organized or an established church like you had in France, uh, Italy, or England, um, Spain. And the result of which was that there was a great deal of uh, acceptance, I would uh, argue, for, uh, for the equality of the various denominations. And when you look at medicine, you find that the same way. Uh, medical orthodoxy uh, was certainly evident in America, but you also had any number of uh, denominations or sec medical sects that had grown up. What you have in, in America is a much more diverse uh, uh, group of medical people, uh, from bone setters to Indian doctors to uh, uh, doctors who uh, were sort of self-proclaimed like Samuel Thompson, uh, and who, who made a circuit much like the old circuit riders of the Methodist uh, preachers. And they would uh, do a 150, 200 mile circuit uh, and, 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 and play that uh, every, every couple weeks. Um, this was the way medicine was practiced uh, in America. It was not a medicine that um, uh, had um, uh, organized medical schools. Uh, uh, many of these, these uh, doctors were apprenticed. And in fact, uh, as, late as, the le as late as the 1760s, you have only a handful of, uh, of uh, uh, university-educated uh, medical doctors. There's something else in here, though, I think that's important, and that is that that America, the, the land itself, had a great deal of influence, I think, on, um, on the nature of medicine. Interestingly enough, you have people like uh, uh, Benjamin Rush and others talk about an American practice. Not a European practice, not an Orthodox practice, but an American practice. And what they meant by that was that now that the United States, now that the, the, the colonies had, uh, had separated from England, and now that they were beginning to, to form their own government, uh, just as, 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 uh, as the colonies had, had 
shown their independence, so also American medicine needed to show its independence from the old world. And this meant breaking off from the old uh, uh, medicines as well as, um, as theories or systems, if you will, of medicine. And so you have an, you, you have a, an extensive literature that speaks to an American practice. And that is a kernel of what becomes then reform medicine, because you find that any number of uh, medical reformers, most of whom started out as orthodox physicians, begin speaking about uh, a new type of medicine, a uniquely American medicine, based on, um, on uh, the herbs and uh, roots and, and so on from the American landscape. And remember, too, that there was that belief, uh, very prevalent at the time, that, um, that when God created the world, that he, he provided each region of the world with its own medicines. That was a sort of an a priori belief held by, held across, across the, um, uh, the landscape. And that added to this idea of a uniquely American uh, practice, I think contributed to the ferment of uh, denominational groups that emerged in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Francis Brinker is a naturopath. He is clinical assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. He's going to introduce us to an important figure in the development of an American practice. Samuel Thompson is really the necessary individual with which to begin to talk about the uh, American herbal movement because he was the person who really popularized it. Prior to that, there were academicians at the University of Pennsylvania who were medical doctors slash botanists who were interested in investigating uh, Native American uses uh, from um, largely just an ob observational perspective. What Samuel Thompson did was to uh, practically apply what he had learned both from Native Amer Americans from his own personal experiences and also from uh, information given to him by one of the uh, local uh, wise women uh, who are really the, the resources of m most folk remedies. And in this day and age, what we're talking about is early 19th century. Uh, Thompson will forever be associated with the herb lobelia. It was one that he discovered the emetic properties himself when he was going around tasting weeds and found that this one would cause a rather dramatic uh, effect of vomiting. And so he liked to play tricks on some of his friends and get them to taste this weed and watch them heave. Uh, tells you a little bit about the character of the man. Uh, Samuel Thompson was real firebrand. Uh, besides the fact that he organized an approach to treatment, uh, wrote it into a book and patented that process as Thompsonian medicine and sold the book with certificates in the back that anyone who purchased the book and read it could then uh, carry that certificate as a Thompsonian practitioner. He, he patented literally a system of medicine. He developed a sort of a six-step process of uh, of cleaning out the system, cleansing it, uh, steaming, uh, using steam, uh, and, uh, and then ultimately um, uh, various uh, herbs to, um, to brace the system and bring it back to strength again. And uh, as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, he decided that uh, uh, one way of protecting this system from, uh, from being used by other imitators was to have it patented. And uh, he went to Washington, he got his six step process patented and then uh, spent most of the rest of his career fighting those in court that, uh, that borrowed from his system. There's another interesting aspect of, of Thompson that, um, that I think a lot of people don't know about, but it, 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 to me it's one of the most curious things. And that is that 
here he was, a young man, going from community to community, uh, selling his, his, his patent. And the question is, how do, you, how do you get people to remember it, many of whom were illiterate? How do you get them to understand, to, to invest in this patent, which uh, costs $20, and, um, and how do you get them to remember how to use it time after time after time? Well, what Thompson did was he wrote poetry. And he wrote a, a form of poetry called a monomic, which is that uh, it, it, is a, it is a form of poetry that is an instruction. And he would, uh, when he would first sell you his patent, he would also give you a poem to read, to memorize. And remember, this is the age of poetry. People are memorizing huge stanzas of it. It was part of family get-togethers. It was part of family entertainment. This is a poem by Samuel Thompson called Botanic Directions. Disorder comes by loosing inward heat, that motion stop which render health complete. The system clogs the juices putrefy. For want of motion, only people die. The medic proves itself designed, a general medicine for mankind. Of every country, clime, or place, wide is the circle of our race. In every cause and state and stage, whatever malady may rage, for male or female, young or old, nor can its value half be told. To use this medicine do not cease till you are helped of your disease. For nature's friend this sure will be when taken sick on land or sea. Let composition be used bold to clear the stomach of a cold. Next, take the compound strong and free to keep as warm as you can be. A hot stone at the feet now keep as well as inward warmth repeat. The fountain above the stream keep clear and perspiration will appear. When sweat enough as you suppose in spirits wash and change your clothes and then set up if you should choose or else in bed in calm repose. Should the disorder reinforce, then follow up the former course. The second time I think will do, the third to fail I seldom knew. Now take your bitters, by the way, two, three, or four times a day. And if your appetite is good, then you may eat most kinds of food. Physics I'd have you seldom use, injections in its stead would choose. For if you physic much in course, it will disorder reinforce. If anyone should be much bruised when bleeding frequently is used, a lively sweat upon that day will start the blood a better way. Let names of all disorders be like to the limbs joined on a tree. Work on the root and that subdue, then all the limbs will bow to you. So as the body is the tree, the limbs are colic, pleurisy. Worms and gravel go and stone, relieve the fountain and they're gone. My system's founded on the truth, man's air and water, fire and earth. The death is cold and life is heat. These tempered well, your health's complete. And then when you would, he would, um, he came back weeks later, uh, and you would memorize the poem, then he would work, walk you through the exercise so that you knew from the poem what to do and w what herb to take, when to take it, uh, what to expect, and so on. And, uh, and this is how families, in fact, uh, if, if they were literate, uh, they, they, they got, as part of the patent, they got a book that explained things. But if they were not uh, uh, literate, they, uh, they were taught to, they, they memorized a poem essentially and used that as a form of instruction. As is often the case in herbal medicine, uh, a strong dominant personality tried to rule the day with his particular bias and 
really the drawback to that system and part of that bias was his opposition to medical education. He was so opposed through his experience of old world medical practices as adopted by the medical profession in America, he really felt like he was offering the new American way, which really emphasized self-sufficiency. If you understand the historical context of Thompson in uh, what's called the Jacksonian era, where uh, the nation was expanding, there were many pioneers on the frontier pushing uh, Anglo-European civilization westward, and because they were on the forefront of the growth, they had to be almost completely self-reliant. Every man was his own carpenter, uh, you have it, you know, veterinarian, his own doctor. It was important that people who lived out uh, away from what would be considered like urban civilization, which at that time was still very primitive in America, had to make do for themselves. And so having knowledge of medicinal activity of plants that grew where they were living was essential for their survival. And what Thompson preached was this doctrine of self-sufficiency that not only could every person be their own doctor, but it was better that way. And so uh, one of the, the main emphasis of his approach to practice was the uh, belief that a lot of sickness, and this I think was from his New England upbringing, was caused by cold and chill. And so his therapy of choice was to bring heat back into the system. It borrowed a lot of the old humoral medicine from the ancient Greek practice, which is really common to Chinese and other traditional uh, systems of medicine. So what he liked to do to bring that heat into people, uh, first he would want to cleanse the system. That's where he used the lobelia to, to purge people, get them to vomit. Then he would use uh, capsicum as a, a stimulant to kind of brace the system and warm it in conjunction with steam baths. He liked to get people sweating. So with the combination of the cayenne and steam and the puking of the lobelia, people would, would go through a transformational experience under this system. And then he also had a series of formulas which he would then apply, one of which uh, was described as being used to uh, remove the canker, uh, which is uh, a nebulous sort of condition that could exist internally or externally, but basically uh, the tonic that he uh, designed to uh, provide this effect was uh, a digestive tonic. It was something that would enhance a person's ability to uh, more efficiently digest uh, food and eliminate waste. And so it was, in that regard, it was very naturopathic in its philosophy. It was a very cleansing system and also tonifying with an emphasis on enhancing nutrition. And so he had the rudiments of a very important and functional system. He just was limited in how far he was willing to carry it. Thompson is a genius. He actually is. He's sort of a self-made genius. But he has, as we will now say today, he has issues. One of his issues is he is a curmudgeon of the first water. He has never met anybody that he can't get into a big argument with. Uh, Thompson is sort of a proponent of my way or the highway. And his belief, he has a profound anti-intellectual bias. Uh, he believes as long as you can read and read his book, that's everything that you need to know about medicine. So he's against any type of education because he has all these lieutenants who are going to help him. And every single time after a year or two or three, he gets into huge arguments with them and they split off. So this happens multiple times. That these people work with him and then split off. So by 1822 or 1825, the estimate is over 3 million Americans are adherents of Thompson's system, which is a considerable part of the population in 1822. So Thompson is really sort of becoming strong in the early 1820s. Beach who founds the Eclectics, starts his clinic in 1825. So the Thompsonians are not that much forerunners of the people who are going to become the Eclectics. All right? And Beach, on the other hand, unlike Thompson, believes in education. He believes in medical school. He's a physician. So you have, at this point, these two competing schools. All right? And yes, there's bad blood between them almost from the beginning, although there's bad blood between Thompson and almost everybody. Okay, He's not an easy guy to get along with. 
one of Thompson's lieutenants, who's the publisher of the um, Thompsonian Recorder, is a man named Alva Curtis. Alva Curtis is a school, starts off as a school teacher, so obviously he doesn't have a profound anti-intellectual bias. And um, he keeps pushing to create a Thompsonian hospital and a Thompsonian medical college. Well, eventually, Thompson and him split over this, okay? Because again, Thompson's totally against this. He's definitely from the Jacksonian democratic tradition. Every man, his own, you know, his own doctor. Every man, his own farrier. It's this whole incredible democratic individuality idea. Well, the reality is, is that not everybody is suited to be their own doctor. Some people are better than others, and more knowledge is not a bad thing. So the, the people who become known as the physiomedicalists split off from Thompson sometime in the 1840s. So that's, that's, uh, the eclectics have already been around, and in fact, by sometime around 1848, they take the name eclectic. And it's kind of funny how they get the name eclectic because they claim that Raffinesque gave them that name. 